All right. Hello, everybody. It looks like we are live. And I am super excited for our broadcast today. We have two special guests. And we are talking about a topic that is so important and so timely right now. We're talking all about how to navigate power and privilege in fundraising. So welcome, folks. Hi, Emma. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you for coming. So, Nicole, Tanya, I'm going to ask you if you could tell us a little bit about, before we dive in, who you are and what you do. That would be great. And, Tanya, I'll start with you. Sure. So, um, my name is Tanya Rumble. Emma and I had the pleasure of connecting when I was a 2016-17 Inclusion and Philanthropy Fellow with the Association of Fundraising Professionals Canada. Um, I work full time at McMaster University in the major in planned giving department um, and I have leadership for the planned giving program at the university and outside of that I'm a leadership volunteer with the Canadian Association of Gift Planners, the Association of Fundraising Professionals and a board director with Find Help which is the operators of 211 um, which is the gateway to um, social services um, in Toronto and actually nationally. I'm a new mom and very, really, very, very excited to be here. All right. Thank you. Nicole, how about you? Yeah, so so happy to be here, Emma. So my name's Nicole McFan. Pronouns I use are they or she. I'm the Director of Corporate Donor Relations at United Way Greater Toronto. And Tanya was just talking about 211 for social services. That's actually founded and funded by United Way. Um, which is fantastic, and we've just gone national, and we know that there's a national need there. Um, yeah, and so I work for United Way. We raise lots of funds uh, through the generous community within the GTA. Uh, I'm a parent as well. Uh, I am tired, and I am uh, really excited to be here today to talk about this topic. It's something really near and dear to me um, in terms of equity and inclusion and how we do better as a fundraising uh, group. So thanks so much for having me. Excellent. Wonderful, wonderful. So if you are just joining us, we are broadcasting live. I really encourage you, if you have any questions for us, if you have any feedback, any thoughts, go ahead and drop those below. And if you are catching up on the replay, go ahead and use the hashtag replay. We'll pop back in and see if you've got any thoughts or questions. So welcome to everyone. And we really encourage you to come on in and participate. That's the beauty of live broadcast like this is you get to like weigh in and interact with us so we really encourage you don't be shy go ahead and uh, let us know what you're thinking and let us know if you have any questions as we have our chat so I'm going to start us off with a question that's just really getting back to basics so we're all on the same page and 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 are using similar language so when we're talking about power and privilege in fundraising what exactly do we mean Paul, do you want to get, kick, kick us off? Sure. So uh, when we talk about power and privilege and fundraising, we're talking about every single interaction we have as fundraisers with our donors, with our volunteers, with mm -hmm. our board members, with our fellow fundraisers of up and down the organization, and especially with our maybe mission or program colleagues and the communities we're trying to serve and support. And so the conversation around power and privilege is about how pervasive it is in all of our interactions and how power balances shift depending on who you're working with um, mm -hmm. and how you're working with them. So it's, it's a fully dynamic, I would say, piece that we need to be taking into consideration. Um, and I also think that power and privilege, we haven't heard much about it, or I haven't heard much about it in my 20 plus year fundraising career. Mm -hmm. And I think it's fundamental to understanding how we do our work and how we mm -hmm. improve uh, in how we do our work. Yeah, and I think I would probably add to that that, um, you know, for me, I remember hearing, you know, about the words of diversity, equity, inclusion, at least mm -hmm. a decade ago, it was part of a lexicon, certainly in, in Toronto and in city building and fundraising and the nonprofit sector. Um, but unfortunately, I don't think we've actually moved the needle on any of those things. Mm -hmm. And so while we might have a bit more diversity, so we might have, you know, if we have a matrix of, of demographics that we want to include maybe on our board or in our staff, people from different racial backgrounds, people of different gender expressions, et cetera, et cetera. 
have we really created an inclusive sector? No, because the power and balance is really heavily weighted still to those communities that are overly represented and those communities that are underrepresented continue to have less power and agency in philanthropy and in dictating how philanthropic funds are used and what communities they support and how they support those communities. So um, I totally agree with everything Nicole said. And I think we just need to shift this dialogue from, you know, we've been talking about diversity and, and inclusion. And it's just not happening. So mm -hmm. just because we might look a little different doesn't mean that people of, of different intersectional backgrounds are truly in positions of power and with um, influence. So I think we're really just excited about the idea of how do we harness our own individual power and privilege mm -hmm. within our spheres of influence because we it's going to take a long time. This is a big ship to write. Um, mm -hmm. And so we just need to sort of take back some of that power and agency for ourselves and figure out how to bring that into our work as fundraising professionals. I love that. I love that. And hopefully we'll get into some practical ideas and actions. We can talk a little bit more, more about that today. But first, could you give us some concrete examples of how you've each seen this show up in various different organizations? And Tanya, I'll, I'll kick it over to start with you and then go back to Nicole. Sure. I mean, I think that organizations um, have responded to the call around anti-Black and anti-Indigenous racism, and many, many organizations have put out statements about standing in solidarity with our Black and Indigenous communities across this uh, Turtle Island. And unfortunately, for a lot of those organizations, it's not substantive. There's nothing behind mm -hmm. that. Um, mm -hmm. Those organizations are lacking in actually addressing anti-Black racism and anti-Indigenous racism within their own institutions. Institutions. And mm -hmm. so saying we, you know, we, we see these movements as important and we support them, but without actually taking stock of what does your board look like? Um, mm -hmm. Who are your, who are your, uh, you know, your most lauded philanthropists? Mm -hmm. Wh who are, who are a part of your senior leadership teams within your organizations? Do you have a pipeline of diverse talent to fill leadership roles in the future? Are you doing everything you can to dismantle anti-Black racism and decolonize your organizations? Um, so I think what we're seeing is that a lot of organizations want to do this work and see how important it is, but really haven't reckoned with their own um, inaction internally. Mm -hmm. And so a couple of examples that you know come to mind are um, thinking about how we um, celebrate philanthropists who have are self-made. Um, mm -hmm. That's an example that for me is super top of mind. This myth of meritocracy is mm -hmm. indeed a myth. And so if we don't acknowledge how people have acquired their wealth and who um, who's been oppressed in order for people to accumulate the resources to be in a position to be philanthropists, we're not telling the whole story. And so a mm -hmm. lot of organizations love to share that this individual pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. Mm -hmm. They were an immigrant from Western Europe, largely, yes, they were an immigrant, but they had all the other marks of privilege um, mm -hmm. and were able to acquire means and resources and build an organization and, and become wealthy on the backs of suffering of other people in this country. And so I see that a lot and I see that a lot in communication from, from organizations celebrating big gifts. And I think mm -hmm. that's a myth that we really need to dismantle. So that's an example that for me shows up quite a lot in philanthropy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would say, like, to build on that with a couple more examples that I see pretty often, um, is the, the the concept of the donor is always right. Mm. Um, and it's something that I learned I for 20 plus years now, that has been how we've thought about fundraising is the donor's right. You have to look at donor centricity in your organization and making sure you're meeting their needs. And I'm not saying, I'm not saying the donor isn't right occasionally or sometimes, but I, what I am saying is that so many times the donor looks to fundraisers um, mm -hmm. to help them understand what's happening in whatever you know, their community, whatever the mission is, and to be able to translate that information. And so I would think about it more from a knowledge exchange point of view, so that what we see is that not jumping at the whim of every donor, in many cases they may be ignorant of different issues that are happening they have their own agenda, which everybody's agenda is biased. And how do we write that ship a bit? And so I see that all the time. We're always reinforcing donors, right? Donors, right? When I think we should take a step back and think about what is it here that we're trying to accomplish together 
And if you think about the word philanthropy, love of humanity, it's how you're educating folks, um, especially our, our donors and our senior volunteers to help them to actually do the good that they want to have and not have unintentional negative impacts. Um, and I would say the other thing I see a lot of is not having the right people at the table. Hmm. So many times internally in our nonprofits, as well as when we look out to say individual or corporate or foundation philanthropy, the people making very important decisions about where funding goes, who is deserving of funding, mm -hmm. how the funding should be administered and what is uh, given as a result of that funding um, are not the people that are most affected by it. And it's mm -hmm. something we have to think quite a lot about in terms of our professional practice. Mm -hmm. That's great. So we have a question coming in. So I'm going to throw it out to you um, from Denise, who just says that, that her board is really struggling with where to start. They've made a statement, they've made a commitment, but they really want to start taking practical action, right? And they're they're trying to figure out what their next step is. Do you have any recommendations if you're thinking about a board taking some of their own leadership around taking action on this? Any thoughts from your perspective of like where to start if uh, for those folks who are who are watching who are board members who are leaders, you know, um, uh, any thoughts for them? Sure, I can start. I think that mm -hmm. if you're as a board thinking about yeah. this, I mean, I think that's step number one. And we're really happy that you're being thoughtful about how you can put your commitment that you've made publicly into action. I think the first is really looking at the board. I think, you know, as I said, we need to move from diversity, equity, inclusion to power and privilege as, as a conversation. But if there isn't diversity there, it's going to be really hard to move the needle on power and privilege. So I think mm -hmm. looking at who um, who is comprised, who is sitting on your board, do you mm -hmm. have representation from the communities that your organization serves? Do you have consumers of your programs and services on the board? You know, that's a real um easy way to sort of reflect a different perspective and, and a different narrative on at the board table because most often a lot of organizations when they're looking for board members are looking for, for people with corporate experience and a corporate mm -hmm. background um, but they may not necessarily have a lot of lived experience with the programs and services and the communities that that your organization serves um, and I think a really simple way is, do we have anyone on our board that identifies as Black or Indigenous or has an Afro-Indigenous background? If not, it's really going to be very difficult to move the needle on addressing anti-Black racism and anti-Indigenous racism without anyone from those communities to inform. And I always say that one is a token, two is an interest group, and three is more of a collective. So inviting one person from those communities, which are diverse within themselves, um, to sit on the board puts a lot of pressure on one person to be a spokesperson for a very diverse cadre of people. Mm -hmm. Two means there's this intercompetition and then looking at these two people to sort of who's the right person, who's the thought leader between the two of them. And then three is where you have collective change. Because to be honest, we've never felt it was a problem before if a board was comprised of 10 men or 10 white people. And so why do we think that only two or fewer people sitting on a board of a diverse background is enough? So I think it's about how do you build that collective? Because without a collective, you can't really make collective change. Mm -hmm. um, I would look at things like, um, you know, working with uh, diverse partners to help recruit those new board members. Because again, if you're still looking in your own personal networks to recruit people, it's going to be really difficult to go outside of, um, you know, the existing demographics that you have represented. And so working with groups like diversity on board is a great way to um, recruit from candidates that have self-identified as being racialized or othered in some capacity that have an interest and the capacity to serve on a board. So I think those are two sort of initial steps that you need to take. I'll turn it over to Nicole now. Yeah, and I would say, so I would agree with all of that. I think the tokenization is a really critical point here. I think we're seeing that a lot in response to the Black Lives Matter movement this summer, and the, the take back your land piece. I would say the other piece around this is classism. So mm -hmm. lots of times we have uh, diversity on boards, but that looks like all people from similar wealth backgrounds. And so depending on the type of mission that you serve, if you're looking at serving 
uh, folks um, that are lower income uh, or in neighborhoods that are struggling. It's not just about having maybe a visible representation, but it's also about looking at classism on your board uh, and the lived experience on your board as well. And Denise, you asked about, you know, we are diverse, but what do we do next? I think uh, one area that you could start is if you've got a strategic or a business plan for the board, I'm not sure how big your organization is, uh, but think about how equity is weaved in to those strategic priorities. Equity is not a project on the side, does not have a start or end date. Maybe sometimes it has a start date, but it should never have an end date. And it shouldn't sit outside of what you're trying to do as an organization. And so that's where I would start is to let, say, look at your top three priorities as an organization and think about an equity lens to that and where um, where your focus on equity can help drive those priorities. Because I think that's how you create sustainable change within an organization. Mm -hmm. That's a, Those are great thoughts. I have one thing I'll add, which I love, it kind of speaks back to what you were saying, Nicole, about the idea of weaving it in. I often talk about the idea of like, embedding this commitment in various different places. So as a board, you can be thinking about how like embedding this in your policies, in your processes, in your procedures, like how is this going to live on beyond this board? And in what ways is that, um, is that showing up, right? In terms of your governance is a good place for a lot of um, boards to start. So that's one additional tip, but lots of, um, lots of great work too and i always encourage folks too is like you know if you do need some support thinking about bringing in some external expertise and support can really help clarify things for you sometimes just in terms of like where you want to go next and there are a lot of great folks working out there right now in terms of um, diversity equity and inclusion so a couple of things to think about so yes so, emma do you mind if i add something else please do Something I've been thinking about more recently is that, um, you know, I'm an extrovert and I don't think, you know, extroversion and introversion, we wouldn't necessarily put as like some sort of um, form of intersectionality. However, um, if you think about that intercultural competence, there are some individuals and um, people of different backgrounds that might, for many different reasons, including oppression, not feel as comfortable being um, speaking um, out in a meeting and sharing their opinions. So I think also having really clear um, decision making processes as an organization and as a board is a really important one because for some folks, they will just never want to speak up in a board meeting, but have really thoughtful contributions to make. And if all decision making is done in this sort of mode that favors people who are more extroverted and who tend to have more power and feel comfortable speaking off the cuff and sharing their opinions in those forums, it sort of often leaves out those people who maybe take time to think or maybe are mm -hmm. newer to the board, newer to the organization, or for various reasons, most, most notably oppression, don't feel like they can um, dissent or offer a differing point of view in that forum. So just making sure that there's space and breathing room for people to think and reflect and offer their opinions outside of just in person and virtual meetings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great point for sure. So yes, if you're just joining us, go ahead. Uh, you can see we are taking questions and feedback and any ideas that you may want to share. Go ahead and drop those below. We'd love to hear from you. Um, we we're talking a little bit um, prior to going live about the idea of, of myths within our organizations. And um, I just want to talk a little bit, what, what do you think some of the biggest myths are related to our topic today that we really need to, to focus on busting in our organizations and in our fundraising? Hmm. Um, so we talked a little bit about the myth of meritocracy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that applies to our donors. I think it also applies to the folks in the fundraising profession. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at fundraising, 70% of fundraising and nonprofit professionals are white women. Mm -hmm. um, and so we think, okay, so these must be the people who are best at this mm -hmm. or, or most deserving of these roles. Um, but the reality is that we're not making a lot of space for other folks to come into the uh, profession. And so to me, that, that's a big myth that there is out there. And I think it gets coupled with this gatekeeper status mm. of how we end up 
um, blocking others, sometimes intentionally, more often unintentionally, mm-hmm. um, uh, in their development. And I think about this like from a um, from a sexist and I would say patriarchal lens. Women are generally uh, have been socialized to be the helpers mm-hmm. in relationships. And so the women end up moving into nonprofits quite a bit more uh, than men. And so then you have this, this imbalance where you have maybe a lot of women working in your nonprofit, but your leadership may be more 50 50 mm-hmm. uh, from a gender lens. And I think that creates, um, it upholds this, this kind of myth of like the, the patriarchy, which is just a construct that I think is, continues, continues to put us at a power imbalance. Um, and I think about that, especially from a white person lens of then how much we are gatekeeping our colleagues of color, um, how much that happens where we don't even see it. It's the water we're swimming in, but mm-hmm. we create so much damage because of it. Um, Tanya, I'm sure you have more to add to this or, or something else. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, I think I certainly relate to everything you've said, Nicole, and, and certainly... I find that one of the biggest myths also is that like having, having people of different skin tones um, and different racial backgrounds is, you know, great. We can pat ourselves on the back. Like we're doing something. Unfortunately, a lot of the time, those individuals are not in positions of leadership and are not given access to opportunities to build their leadership capacity, Mm -hmm. or even if they have that leadership capacity to exercise said leadership capacity. So that to me is a big myth because I think organizations have genuinely tried to try to diversify their their fundraising pipeline, but it's not seeming to make a difference at the top. So um, I see that as a big myth. I think the other myth is um, that, you know, we need to sort of go after the donors that are are self-identifying and, and those that have, um, you know, historically given, like, why would we, why would we not go after those resources? And I don't think what we're suggesting is to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but at the end of the day, why would people from diverse backgrounds want to give to your organization if you haven't historically done a very good job of engaging with them and built meaningful, authentic relationships that don't begin with asking for gifts. Mm -hmm. Um, And so I think that that to me is a big mistake. You know, I've been in organizations where it's like, we need a South Asian strategy. I heard that like this particular demographic within the South Asian community is very philanthropic and look what they've done for X organization. I think we can build some relationships there. Well, if those relationships don't come from a place of mutual benefit um, at the start, you know, you can't really ask people to get involved philanthropically. Um, And then I think that there's also this myth that philanthropists are altruistic. And I think we also, many of us know that there are many reasons that people give and recognition and status are part of it. Um, Mm -hmm. But I think that there's also this importance that Nicole touched on, on how do we take back our power in understanding how those philanthropic dollars are needed and what are some of the conditions that we would put around those? And so in the past, you know, we, we often see these kind of photo ops with people who are lauded as philanthropists um, and maybe a a deserving person from an under-resourced community in a picture with them, either the recipient of a scholarship or a student in an education program that they funded And we create this awful imbalance and this awful narrative that people of a particular class, racial group, or having other intersectional dimensions of diversity need a hand up. And they're so grateful for the support. But I think that we need to think about this more as as an exchange. I think philanthropists and people that are in a position to give have a real... um, need and opportunity to learn so much from our sector and from the people and programs that they're supporting with their dollars. And so it needs to be more seen as a two-way thing. So Mm. we think about how do we build these stewardship reports for our our donors and how do we build recognition for them? Well, where do we build in the learning for them also? And where Mm -hmm. is there an information exchange where we can say, not only this is what we're doing with your dollars, but you know, here, here's more about the systemic issues that no one has, you know, talked about as to why we need to fund maybe other elements of this work that aren't sexy and that aren't going to get your name in the Globe and Mail. Mm -hmm. Excellent. 
I love it. So we are hitting around 25 minutes. So I'm going to ask one or two more questions to wrap us up today. Um, one that's really on my mind is just around the idea of practical action that folks can take um, in their own work or their own organization. So if you each had wanted to leave viewers with just one idea to take away today, maybe something that's a little more practical or action oriented, what would that idea be? That's a tough one, Emma. <laughs> All right, I know. You probably have many more. <laughs> um, I think I have, I'll, 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 I'll be cheeky and I'll, I'll take, I'll give two. So I one, love cheeky. <laughs> I'll say that um, the Circle on Philanthropy, which is an organization, an indigenous led organization that does incredible work here in Canada. Um, they had a recent um, a forum on racial equity in philanthropy, and they actually laid out a number of commitments that people in our sector can make mm -hmm. to action um, their own personal commitment to advancing this work. So I would say look there on the Circle's website mm -hmm. under resources, and there's about ten steps that you can that you can look at that are that are both things that you can do at an individual, interpersonal, and organizational level to change the dynamics around um, racial equity in philanthropy. Mm -hmm. And then two, I would say um, just that constant curiosity. I think that when you at, approach things with this attitude of inquiry and you're genuinely intellectually curious, people want to reveal more of themselves and are very open to sharing their experiences and insights with you. And if you're constantly learning and constantly approaching things as I'm not an expert, I still have more to learn. I'm never going to be at the end of my journey. I think that you're always going to be in a position to learn so much more about um different perspectives than you might think. So for example, I'm learning more about neurodiversity because it's not something I've had a ton of exposure to. I know the term, I understand what it means, but I think there's more that I can personally learn about how to um, bring an approach in my work as a fundraiser that supports people of all neurodiversity. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, so there was um, a bit of an image going around social media for a while that said something to the effect of, uh, if you read six mountain climbing books, you're not considered an expert at mountain climbing. Mm -hmm. And so I think about that from a from an equity lens of, you know, I hope folks are, you know, reading, listening, doing lots of, of work themselves to take that knowledge in. But I would say one thing that holds us back is this myth that you have to be perfect and you're not going to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And I would say the first, the most important thing we can do is to take action. Uh, so we're presenting at AF when we've created the, the content for it, we're not diversity trainers, we're not experts, we're fundraisers. Mm -hmm. But it was like, let's take an action mm -hmm. that will help drive our own knowledge and also help drive some conversation within the community that we love and we're passionate about. So I would encourage people to take uh, take some form of action rather mm -hmm. than just, just take it in. Okay, great. And I'll go ahead and add any links of uh, regarding resources that we're talking about to the replay so that folks can find those easily. Um, and I'll also make sure that I include information about what you have coming up for anyone who wants to take a deeper dive into the topic. You are going to be at Not Congress. So tell us a little bit more about that session, when it's happening and where folks can find it. Awesome. Um, okay, so we'll be presenting on the last uh, and third day of Congress, or should I say not Congress, not Congress. that's taking <laughs> place um, the week of November 23rd. We're presenting on Wednesday, November 25th at 10.15 in the morning. Um, there is going to be a 90-minute session that Nicole and I are leading, and we're really excited to be doing that. It's going to be on power and privilege and really focused on the tactical strategies that you as a fundraiser can bring into your work because I don't think we've seen a lot of conversation about how to bring power and privilege and the perspective around that into philanthropy. So it's going to be interactive, engaging, and really draw from everyone's collective experience and insight. So um, do register at the AFP Toronto website if you haven't already. And if you are signed up for Congress, simply tune in on the 25th at 10, 15 a.m. It's going to be great.
I know I'm going to be there. I'm already registered and it's great because I feel like it's a very um, more accessible than usual price point for if we're not Congress this year. So yes, come on out and uh, join us. Love to see you at that session. And I will make sure we include a link and more information uh, in the post for the replay here. So thank you both so much for taking time out of your day. I know what a busy season this is. And uh, I think our conversation is, has been great and it's so important and uh, love that we've had folks tuning in and asking questions and I encourage you, even if you are catching up on the replay, yeah, let us know if you have any additional questions or, uh, or feedback. We would love to hear from you and hopefully we'll see some folks out at uh, your session at AFP, not Congress. So thank you so much to you both, Kenya and Nicole, and thank you to everyone who is watching and uh, we will sign off, say bye for now. Thank you, Emma. Thanks so much. Bye.